Hello, it's Philip Taylor speaking from Richmond Green Chambers in London. Today I'm reviewing a book which has come to us from Hart Publishing in Bloomsbury, PLC. This is an important work and one that I think is possibly undervalued and not and, and actually insufficient attention is paid to the work of the Law Commission, which is why I welcome um, the book and, and I wanted to review it. The book's title is The Work of the British Law Commissions. There are two of them. <coughs> it's Law Reform Now? Question mark. It's been written by Shona Wilson Stark. It's available as a, a hardback and a PDF and an e-book. Um, as I say, it's an imprint of Bloomsbury from uh, Heart Publishing, which is the imprint of Bloomsbury. Now, for my review, I've given the title of the book review. Uh, the great work of the Law Commission is examined in detail, but simply not enough reporting to allow for substantial law reform. Now, I make that criticism right at the beginning because one of the things I've found is that many people don't really know very much about what the Law Commission does. We do take it for granted, and I don't think it does enough work because the problem is supply and demand, putting it bluntly. Um, we do need to have reforms, um, but we're not getting them. That's the problem. So, in fact, there is a demand for reform but the supply of the information to reform is all consumed by other issues. The main one at the moment, of course, being Brexit. Now, um, I say that because one of the problems is that Parliament can be hijacked very quickly and become very much um, an organisation that reacts to events rather than, within the British Constitution, looking at the legal framework we have and the way we are going to have to change things in the future because clearly there are a lot of areas where there is an urgent need for a review of the services offered. I can think of the police, the prison service, the courts and a whole range of other areas. So uh, without singling anything out specifically, let's talk about this particular book and its value because I'm sure law students will find it helpful. What we say about the book, obviously I'm going to talk about it in a moment. Let's look at it first of all. It's a hardback. Lovely cover. I like the cover, actually. It was sort of uh, resting, if I can put it that way. There's the spine. It's a hardback. You can see there's a spine. There's not much on the back. It just refers to her other book, which I will mention in my review. Then there's just a little bit about the author on the back inside dust cover. The front, there's a bit of blurb about the book itself, some of which I've borrowed, not very much, because actually my review is slightly different. The index itself is there. You can see it, and it's by... Um, page numbering. It's not a particularly detailed index, but you should find anything you're looking for because it's not a big book. 200, it's under 300 pages. There's the bibliography, very detailed. It's a very erudite work, without a doubt, and she's put a great deal of effort in, as shown her. There's the bibliography there, and then you've got um, two appendices. There's that one, and then there's an earlier one, Appendix 1, um, on Chairman and Commissioners. Then we go to the front of the book, and you can see in the front, um, if we get to the front page, um, what we've got on the front page is there's some basic blurb. Again, that's just repeated really from what's in the inside cover. Then there's the main front page there. Then you've got the blurb about the book itself, then acknowledgements, and details about uh, what's in it from... Um, <coughs> the author in Cambridge dated December 2016 in the table of contents there quite a large amount of information given and then um, there are basically seven main chapters plus the appendices and then an index then you've got the table of cases not that much and then a bit of legislation as well you can see the legislation including non-UK legislation then table of GP commission material now, I found this quite interesting because that is where you're going to find out what they've actually been doing and the actual number of the reports, the, and then it covers the, the reports themselves and the actual names of the reports, depending on what you might be looking for. Um, and then after that, um, you get to the, the basic book itself, which is the body copy. Now, you haven't got paragraph numbering, but you do have footnotes, and you've got some subheads, as you can see, running all the way through. It's a detailed work. Um, it's very well written. And it's not for, putting it bluntly, it's not for beginners. 
it's a book where you have to have some understanding of what the processes are. But as I say, I thought this book would be very useful for anyone who's reading for a degree, certainly for a, a higher degree. But in any event, it's a book which um, will attract, I'm sure, a lot of interest. Now, what we say about the book is this. The inspiration and sheer hard work which created this excellent book arose from um, Shona Wilson Stark's work for a doctoral uh, thesis undertaken at Cambridge University. And she had a spell at the Scottish Law Commission, which obviously would have been extremely helpful. Now, scholars, we think, will find it useful to read another excellent title from Shona and her publishers, that's Hart and Bloomsbury, which is entitled 50 Years of the Law Commissions, The Dynamics of Law Reform. And that's mentioned on the back of the book there, because it's a really sister book, if you like, to go with it. Um, because we believe it offers an additional, <coughs> excuse me, brilliant piece of detailed research for anyone pursuing this subject in some depth. And I'm not talking, as I said, about undergraduate necessarily, but I'm certainly talking about uh, additional um, research up to and including both masters and uh, doctoral level. And the new book is invaluable, I think again, specifically now for undergraduates wishing to gain a greater knowledge of both the Law Commission of England and Wales and the Scottish Law Commission, uh, which were both established in 1965 to promote the reform of the laws of their respective jurisdictions. And of course, since that time, they've produced hundreds of reports across many areas of law, which have been of great benefit to everyone in the furtherance of legal reform. And readers will know that the commissions are thankfully independent of government. <clears throat> However, they do rely, of course, on government funding and government approval for their proposed projects, which is always a bit of a snag, frankly, with these, these areas, because you can see there could be allegations that Certain areas are not going to be looked at and other areas are going to be given prominence. <clears throat> but that's the breaks. And of course, they also rely on both the government and parliament to implement their proposals, which is an even bigger and more tedious snag if one thinks about it in that way. Now, what I'm saying is let's be proportionate to use the expression about that, because at the end of the day, it's, a, it's about positive outcomes for the work of the commission. And we've got a lot of examples of them. But as I've said, I think probably we need more of it sooner. And we do need to actually to have an overhaul of where we're going, certainly towards the middle of this century. Now, Shona looks at what she calls the tension between independence and implementation and offers sensible and constructive recommendations on how a balance can best be struck between the two. And she gives some suggestions about how the commissions should choose their projects. Uh, quote, given that their duties outweigh their resources, always the biggest single problem, I have to say. And she suggests that we should, uh, how we should assess the success or otherwise of their output. Again, difficult to do, I think. Just to set the record straight, however, legal systems across the world have created law reform bodies in the Commission's image. That's very flattering, actually, which is some recognition of their importance in the more global legal world we inhabit today. And what we found helpful were the pointers given on what Shona calls the GB Commission's responses to the changes and challenges they have faced, so that the thesis she's produced allows a reappraisal of their own law reform machinery in other systems. And of course, that is very useful for comparative law purposes. Now, in addition, she says that the GB commissions may seek inspiration from other commissions experiences for the purposes, again, of comparative law studies, as so many problems have much more of a global connection. Now, and I can tell you they do. Having been to a number of different parts of the world, different continents, I am always amazed well, I shouldn't really be, but I am. In fact, we've got the words we use. They're still the same problems. And it doesn't really make a great deal of difference because it all gets down to a number of particular factors. However, what we're talking about here is structure. And as um, she comments, ruefully, I suspect, the world the GB commissioners inhabit now is very different to when they were established. Absolutely right. And one of the reasons, again, why I'm saying that we ought to be looking at expanding what we're doing because there's an urgent need 
probably to codify, codify some areas and an urgent need to review some of the more archaic practices within the legal world that are still persist. And we've got, I don't want to sweep things away, but we've, we really have got to start reassessing where we are to produce something that is, to use the ex dreadful expression, fit for purpose for the 21st century. Let me conclude by saying that, of course, the commissions have evolved to remain relevant in the face of political events. Devolution, the UK's uh, changing relationship with the European Union in a post-Brexit world, increasing pressure for accountability and decreasing funding. So nothing really much has changed if you think about it from that point of view. And a particular um, point for the political scientist, I feel, are the positive comments on securing the future of independent law reform at a time of massive legal upheaval and the lack of preparation for the innovations of the fourth industrial revolution, uh, which are now before us. But in any event, thank you, Sean. A very thought-provoking thesis, and I'm very glad it's been published. Thank you also to Hart and Bloomsbury for undertaking the publication. The book's published on the 13th of July, 2017, and I'm recording this in the autumn of 2017. There's the little logo for Hart, just to give them some publicity. There's the book again, Spine. There we go, and then the back, nothing much on the back. Just opening it in the middle, let's have a little look and see. Reasons for tasking the commissions with codification. Interesting. There we go, lots of uh, footnotes again. You can see the structure, a little bit of subheadings. But again, I mentioned codification earlier. There's been a requirement, I think, and it's still there, uh, for complete codification of the criminal law and the law of evidence. Those areas in themselves, I think, would be... They're mammoth, oh, ma mammoth tasks. But we've got to start thinking about it. We we put it off and put it off, um, and then just things just grow. And at the moment, we've got a real big problem. If you look at things like the White Book, an Archbold, and the Family Court practice, they're expanding and expanding and expanding, and it's it's getting worse. There's no way that we know what the law is in any area. No one can say they understand uh, all the provisions of the tax code, for instance. So we've got to be realistic about what our goals and objectives are. I think simplicity, so certainly codification, giving a little bit of rigidity to the system will be useful. Thank you, Shona, and thank you to all. Do, do read this book. It's a great read. Bye-bye.